Hey guys, it's Shaylin. I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is the series where I just chat about the last 10 books that I read. Super chill. We just hang out. We talk about books. Not really much preamble to say for this one. All I can really say is, as always, I believe reading is a very personal subjective thing. This is just kind of how I felt about the books when I was reading them, not like some kind of correct professional analysis. It's just how I felt while reading these books and why I felt the way that I felt about them. But there are a lot of collections in this video. I read like six collections in a period of just like a couple weeks because I was trying to get back into writing short fiction. I felt like I had forgotten how short stories worked. So I was just trying to consume a ton of short stories. The first book is a collection and it's How by Yi Chun. So this is a collection that focuses almost exclusively on Chinese women both in the US and in China. This was a fantastic collection. Of the six collections I read, it's definitely one of my favorites. I've been having a bit of a will, will they, won't they with this book for a while. Like I just think the cover is so beautiful. This was just an extremely well put together collection. The writing is so clear and concise fluid, um, kind of gently insistent, crisp water, you know? In a collection especially, like being able to communicate a lot very effectively, very clearly in the short pieces, it just like especially stands out when the writing is high quality and just really, really strong writing. There are a few stories throughout that are just like really impactful, but almost all of them are are quite good. There was really only one that I didn't care for. Each story on its own may not be like the best story I've ever read. Like I don't think there was one in here where I was like, wow, my mind is blown. But this collection works very well, like cohesively, you know, as a unit. Sometimes with collections, I feel like the collection format is almost a detriment to the individual stories. Reading them all together, they blur together and they lose their impact. Here, I thought that this was just very well put together. Each story contributes to the overall effect of the book and there's there's a cohesiveness in style and tone that makes the, every story feel like it was meant to be here, but they still stand, stand on their own and don't all blur together. You don't feel like you're reading the same story over and over. I don't know, there's just, there's something very understated but special about this collection. It's very subtle. There's something very subtle about why it works so well. It gets a very gentle, understated book. So then I read another collection, Better Living Through Plastic Explosives by Gigi Gardner. So I have read a couple of Gigi Gardner stories before. So I've been meaning to read a full collection by her for ages and I was expecting to love this because I've read her novel. She has one of the most electric Pro styles. There's not really a central topic of this book, but it's just like an extremely explosive, an extremely explosive collection. A lot of satire, very high concept stories, and they're all very distinct from each other. <laughs> My first note about this book is this book is just so much to deal with LMAO. So it's a very absurdist book, of course. It's overwhelming. Every single sentence introduces something wildly new to the story. I thought my brain ran fast because I can't talk as fast as I think. I thought I was a very frenetic person whose brain was constantly running the mile a minute. I think Gigi Gardner's brain runs so fast that I'm surprised she hasn't been blasted into orbit. Here's the thing, you know me and specificity. I think specificity is the most beautiful thing. I, I sing serenades, I sing hymns about specificity. I'm gonna say something you never thought you'd hear from me. There was too much specificity. Every single sentence introduces some wildly new detail. I would get halfway through each story and be like, what is this about? Because it was about a million different things. And I think that that got in the way of me ever really connecting to a character. The last two stories are definitely the best, in my opinion. We Come in Peace and Better Living Through Plastic Explosives. They have the clearest sense of concept. Both of those, I was like, oh, there's a cohesive story happening here. It's like her writing is very confident. So it's not that they feel unfocused. It's almost that they feel overdeveloped. We love specificity, but she specified so much to the point that the concept, the characters, the plot development were buried in just like a million details constantly assaulting your senses from every possible angle. It is distracting. It's like, I don't know if I've ever been able to say this about a book, but the writing is too good. It's like she's too good at writing that the writing swallowed the stories. The best analogy that I could think of for this book is it's like being given a dish that has so many ingredients that you don't know what you're supposed to be tasting. Like you don't know what the cohesive taste of the meal is, but every single individual ingredient is the most 
like finely sourced ingredient of all time. It's been treated with utmost care, but together there's just too much on the plate. That's my MasterChef analysis of Better Living Through Plastic Explosives by Juji Gardner. I don't know, I admire her writing a lot, that's the thing. I really admire her writing because I think no one's doing it like her. She did it almost too much, I think. So then I read a novel, Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This is, well, pitched as, but we'll talk about the genre in a second, a horror about a woman whose wife goes on a deep sea mission, because she's a marine biologist, ends up going missing and comes back weeks later, weeks after she was supposed to come back and she's not quite the same. Marine biologist lesbian horror just ticked every box for me. So I really enjoyed the writing. It's very, there's a very hazy sense of atmosphere. There's such a distinct mood to this book. I could picture and this very clear overarching mood that you can pretty much feel. It's, it's a great exercise in mood and the heart of Miri and Leo's relationship makes it very intimate feeling. Like most of the book is really just focused around these two characters and it's a really interesting, it's just nice to get that really like personal exploration of a sapphic relationship in a book. So I found this, you know, it's very alluring and eerie and atmospheric, um, really pulls you, very immersive. To be honest, like, this wasn't really horror to me. To me, this was eerie fabulism, but it's not really horror. I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it for the way that it was marketed to me, which was as a horror book. You know, the, the final reveal, that moment of what is the horror leading up to, is so brief. Like, it's a page. So it felt like we were held at this point of suspense, waiting for the horror, and then when we got it, it wasn't really shown. You know, at some points, it's it's a little too slow burn. It's, maybe that's just because I was expecting a horror book, and but I, I really try to divorce my expectations from what a book ends up being. Um, I think that's unfair to the book. But maybe because I was expecting a horror, I was expecting a bit more payoff and intensity. It, it's quite slow burn, you know, for a, a payoff that's kind of just one page long. And there's also just a section from around the one half to three quarter mark where it feels like it gets a little stuck on itself. But I, all in all, I really enjoyed the, this dreamlike haziness that we get in Mary's chapter, which contrasts with the um, really unnerving eerie claustrophobia that's in Leah's chapter when she's in a submarine sinking deeper and deeper into the depths of the sea for weeks on end. Terrifying. Then I read another collection, This Accident of Being Lost by Leanne Batasmasak Simpson. This is a really unique collection that blends quick little anecdotes and poetry and there's some genre bendy stuff. So it's not really like your standard short story collection or really standard anything, but it doesn't have to be. It's kind of just doing its own thing and thriving. The poems in here were also fantastic. It's really cool to see an author blending forms. The way the poems worked with these kind of brief anecdotal stories felt so cohesive. It, it almost didn't even feel like they were different forms. It felt like they were meant to go together. You know, the stories kind of don't really feel like stories. They're, they're more like moments, really short, pretty short moments. But yet I didn't really find myself wanting more from them. Like they felt very whole. There's also this kind of like deadpan, sarcastic wit throughout, which is really enjoyable. It's a very casual voice, which I really liked. Like that, to me, that made the book feel very honest and personal because it didn't feel like a voice that was being created or forced uh, for purpose of literary unpacking. You know, it's not like this was a character that we're gonna create so we can explore them in a, in a piece of literature. Like, it felt very honest, very personal. It didn't feel like there was any kind of interference of art. Like, there was no point where I was like, oh, this was being done for artfulness. Like, it was just being done uh, for honesty. And it's very rare that you can see that. But um, I really enjoyed that aspect of this book. So then I read a graphic novel, No One Else by R. Kikuo Johnson. I actually read this for a book club, but then I couldn't, I ended up not being able to make the book club meeting. But I'm still glad that I read this. It's beautiful. So this is the story of Charlene, who is a single mother. She's been caring for her elderly father, but he passes away at the beginning and her brother ends up returning home. And it just brings up a lot of tension between them. You know, she's trying to apply to medical school. He comes back into their life after for years, she's been the caretaker for their father. It's set in Maui. Uh, it's just a very quiet slice of life, very, very gentle story. You know, very quiet story, very little plot, but I thought it was a very affecting portrait of how every member of this family deals with grief in their own very subtle way and how they try but also fail to help each other through their grief. The art is beautiful. It's mostly monochromatic, just blues, but then there's just these little pops 
well this is a big pop of orange like okay this is this is again a, a full thread like look how beautiful this is the art is just really beautiful the use of color is really beautiful it's really minimal very cute minimal kind of soft style that really complements the story i did think there were some transitions between scenes that were quite confusing like we just jump locations without warning a lot of the time it's a graphic novel so in many ways it's kind of just a, you can just sit down and read it it's just a short story but the art is beautiful and it's a really sweet affecting storyline so then i read bless the daughter raised by a voice in her head by warson shire this is a book of poetry love warson shire so much her chat book teaching my mother how to give birth was one of the first books of poetry i ever read and i credit that book for getting me into poetry you might know warson shire she's most known for her poem home is a really triumphant poem but if you've encountered that poem and haven't read a full collection of her i would definitely recommend giving her her full collection to read because as much as po as home is a just an um, incredible poem all of her poems are that incredible they're really all that good and she has an incredible range of poetry that's all stunning like there's there's not a dud in here you know she does really playful smart things with tone makes the poems just so exciting to read just these little subtle shifts in tone at just the right moments you know the narrative poems are these little snippets of life that feel so grand in their smallness like that are so precise but feel so important in their in their smallness and specificity the lyric poems are just beautiful uh this was this was everything that i could have wanted and more so then i read disorientation by elaine she chu uh this book follows a grad student named ingrid who's in like her seventh year of her phd program she's studying this like famous chinese american poet as she's trying to find an angle for her thesis she ends up discovering something about him that draws her deeper and deeper into the into the ingrained institutional racism of her university this just went for academia's jugular and I loved every second of it. It's a very weird book. There's a lot going on, total fever dream, but it really works. So this is a satire and it's one of those satires that honestly feels more real than realism. All the satirical details are just 100% accurate. Like that's what makes them funny is how accurate they are. There's a lot going on. It just, it kind of all works together. Um, overall, this was fantastic. T to be honest, I think there are just points where it gets a little bloated. Um, like it's quite long. There are some sections where it starts to get a little silted. For most of the characters, we're able to see their humanity and their depth through the satire. There are just a few moments where I kind of wish the satirical walls would have been let down a little bit more, just to let the characters breathe a little more naturally on the page. This was very nuanced in its discussions of racism in and out of academia, and in many different contexts. It felt like the ideas and topics in the story were fully excavated really deeply explored and the narrative plot still stayed on track and I think that that's extremely impressive while still having those ideas drive a compelling narrative and set of characters like that's a very hard balancing act to pull off and this book does it so then I read ah there we go Venus in the Blind Spot by Junji Ito so I've mentioned this in the past few recent reads but a friend of mine and I have a translated horror book and movie club currently in our translated horror I mean we have so many books we want to read but we've going through a lot of Junji Ito's work. People keep commenting on the Uzumaki in my my to read pile. I think that that's the next one we plan to read. But we read Venus the Blind Spot, which is one of his short story collections. As always, the art, 10 out of 10, he just has, like this was just, the art is incredible. A couple of the stories are actually in full color. It's so visually impactful. The best story in here, uh, The Enigma of Amagara Fault. Definitely the best one in the book. Fantastic story. I remember reading that story years ago and it still stuck with me. So some of the other stories are also fantastic. Like the first few in the book are fantastic. Enigma of Amagara Fault, fantastic. The one about himself, I don't know why it's in the book. There's one that's just like autobiographical and it's so out of tone with the rest of the book. It was so jarring to me, but it was still overall a beautifully drawn um, collection and most of the stories are fantastic and genuinely unnerving <laughs> which is what you want from horror so then i have the last collection radio belly by buffy cram again very eclectic range of stories hard to pin down uh, there's not really a central topic but they're just kind of wild quirky quirky stories to me this had a very strong case of what i call short story collection syndrome which is basically a bunch of really interesting concepts where when you read the jack you're like those all sound like the best concepts i've ever read 
But then in application, the execution is just a little too bland. The concepts aren't leaned into as much as they could have been. So then it ends up feeling a little underwhelming and you don't really get as much impact or feeling as you could have, which is too bad. However, there are a couple really fun stories in here. The last one, especially floatables set on a floatable raft of garbage because the world has flooded. That was wild. The, the concepts are fantastic. The writing is strong. I think I just really wish the concepts would have been leaned into more and we could have gotten the full impact of these really fantastic concepts. So then I read Mona by Paula Oylixaro. This book is about a writer named Mona and she's kind of in a bit of a self-destructive spiral and she ends up getting invited to a prestigious literary, very hoity twitty literary award in Sweden and it's just kind of her hanging out there with all these other writers. I don't know, this is compared a lot to like Eileen, you know, un you know how I feel about unhinged women fiction. That's my favorite subgenre of fiction. Mona as a character just didn't feel specific enough or close enough to the narrative to carry a book that is just a character portrait of her. I mean, obviously she's in this specific situation. It's a character portrait, it's a character study, but the narrative just didn't feel close enough to her and she didn't feel like she had enough specificities. Like, yeah, she was a mess. We love a character who's a mess. She just didn't feel specific enough and the narrative felt too far from her for me to feel like I was immersed in her chaotic internal journey and to feel like I was taking away something specific from the character. It's not like she's a terrible, completely bland character. Like she was definitely part way there. But I think I just needed more of her character to take away what I would want to take away from a book that is a character study, which is feeling like I've just gotten extremely close to an extremely specific, interesting person. So that is all for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I would love to hear what you have been reading lately. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video.